Well, we've missed a week, but that was for a good cause. That was for Easter. We missed a week of class. I want to pick up where we were before. We've talked about a couple things. One is how would how does Jesus tell us to read scripture? And we looked at some places where we saw Jesus was saying, it's all about me. Moses was writing about me. You, you got to search the scriptures. You think you're looking for life in them, but they speak of me. We looked at that as Jesus saying, you need to interpret the scripture. And of course, what he's specifically talking about is the Old Testament, which is sometimes difficult to read in a Christ-like manner, but he's saying it's speaking about me. The other thing we looked at was we talked a little bit about how that has been done historically in the church. And in a, as a quick review, said there were two major parts, a kind of natural reading, the literal reading, which has to do with what that author was trying to communicate in that context, in that day and time, to whomever he was addressing or she was addressing the words. But then there was a spiritual reading, and that falls into three parts that underneath, or somehow maybe you should say superseding the natural reading, there is a spiritual meaning which is not tied to that literal natural reading, and it can be read as allegory or metaphor, it can be read uh, as prayer or moral, and it can be read as mystical or contemplative. And so we kind of went over the three of those and illustrated them a little bit. We're going to do some more illustration of what that looks like so that we can, so if it's not real clear yet, we can practice it. But what I want to do today is I want us to look at something that Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the thing is, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 really illustrates both the points I'm talking about. One, he's going to talk about how you can only understand Scripture from the standpoint of Christ. He's going to make that eminently clear. And he's actually going to allegorize something out of the Old Testament. So he's actually going to practice one of the things that we're saying is how you read it spiritually. So we're we're going to kill two birds with one stone, with one passage today. So here we are. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Greg, I've never pictured someone throwing a Bible at birds. (laughs) Well, today this scripture is... This passage will help us, yeah, knock down two birds. That's the literal reading. That's the literal reading of, yeah. It's a literal, that's the literal sense of what I just said. It is. But I was speaking metaphorically, of course, right? Okay. Um, so, it's, I, I don't want to read too much of, let's start in verse 7. Um, the hard part is picking out where to start to get to the point. So he's been talking about the difference between the preaching of Christ, the gospel, versus the reading of Moses' law. In other words, kind of what the Jewish sense of faith and belief and uh, fidelity to God was, what that was for them, surrounded as it was, as it was by the reading of, of the law, versus this gospel of Christ, which is all about the movement of God's spirit rather than the law. And he's, he says, well, okay, we'll, we'll start in verse five. We'll just maybe have to do more than I wanted, but let's start in verse five. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to, con- to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He's talking about we, like Paul and others who are preaching the gospel. We're not adequate in ourselves, but you know, we're, we're speaking uh, because we trust God to work. Verse 6, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not the old one, but a new one. Not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And the letter is, of course, he's going to say what was written on tablets of stone. 
but was delivered to Moses. That's of the letter, and that kills, but the Spirit whom God has given to us is giving life, and it's a whole different way of relating to God. That's what he's talking about. Um, Verse 7, but if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones, reference to Moses receiving the law, if the ministry, he calls it a ministry of death, he can do that because he was a Pharisee, right? He's not, out, he's not standing as an outsider to that system criticizing it. He's criticizing it as the, the insider who was an expert in that system, right? So it's kind of like he's earned the right to say that's a ministry of death because, hey, I was the Pharisee who lived it, right? But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently on the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So he's going to allegorize. And the story he's referring to is found in Exodus 34. It's after Moses goes up on the mountain Having been in the presence of God, he comes down and his face is radiant with the glory of God. And the Israelites are scared to death about this guy who's got the glowing face, right? Nobody wants to, they're all just scared of Moses. So what Moses starts to do, and this is in Exodus 34, you can read the story, he puts a veil over his face, which he keeps over his face when he's around the Israelites But when he goes to speak with God, he takes it off. That's the story that Paul is now going to allegorize. In other words, take a spiritual reading of a story about an event that if you just read the story, you think it's just a, you know, just a strange occurrence that that happened. If someone's relating to us the facts of an event, but Paul sees a spiritual meaning to it. Um, So he says, what Moses got came with glory. The glory that like radiated from his face because he'd been in the presence of God. It came with glory. But he's saying, if that came with glory and it's a ministry of death and of the letter and really doesn't give life, how much more glorious is our gospel of the new covenant, which is about Christ? That's got to exceed the old one in glory. If that one had glory, this one's going to have much more. That's, that's the point he's making. So verse um, 10, for indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, how much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay. Paul say, and he's saying over their heart, but I think it applies to anyone who attempts to read the Old Testament without the light of Christ. There's going to be a veil over their understanding. That's what Paul say. And again, Paul is able to say that because he was an expert in that Old Testament law and in what it said, and he was this vigorous, zealous person who followed it. He was the Pharisee, and he can say, honestly, I had a veil over my heart. I was not a loving man. I was not a gracious man. I was not a merciful man. All the things of God remained hidden behind a veil of my own inability to understand what this text was saying. But he says, only in Christ and by Christ, when a person comes to the Lord, is that veil removed, and then they can read those Old Testament scriptures differently. 
which is exactly what we've been saying, right? So it shouldn't be surprising that a lot of people go, well, Jesus I like, but man, the Old Testament, I don't know what to make of some of those stories, right? Paul would say, that's my point. You can't make something of those stories unless you start with Jesus, because if you try and read those stories as they are, they're not often Christ-like. They're full of murder and anger and, and things that Jesus says don't do, they say do. So, so Paul is saying the same thing Jesus was saying. You can't read it unless you really read it about Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to have a veil over your heart, your, over your understanding, basically. Okay, questions, thoughts? There? I, I don't know. I, this might be a pedantic thing, but it's, it seems like Paul goes on to talk about um, the Lord is the Spirit. Yeah. And he's and he says that again later, uh, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's maybe not. I don't know if this help it like is helpful, but it seems like he's not uh, explicitly tying it straight to Christ. There, it's through it's Christ enabling us to access the Spirit and the freedom of reading. It. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. No, no, you're you're right because he's gonna. Yeah, he's gonna say now. It's the veil is lifted in Christ, and and we're talking about the movement of the Spirit. So the way I, the way I said it uh, last time, I said Scripture does not teach us who Jesus is. Jesus reveals Himself through the Spirit. Right? So I was, I was I was postulating the dilemma. You, if someone says, "Yeah, Greg, you're saying we have to read Scripture from understanding Christ," but I can't understand Christ unless I read the Scripture. You've got me in an endless loop. And I was saying, no, no, you don't understand Christ because you read the scripture. You understand Christ because he sends his spirit and his spirit reveals to you who he is. Now, he may actually do that as you're reading scripture, but don't, don't get it wrong. It's not your reading of words f from a text that is gaining you this knowledge. It's the spirit working within. Now, that may, for, for some of us, um, well, I actually grew up in a kind of a tradition where we didn't really talk about the Spirit having any enlightening sort of function. Um, we really did put it down to our ability to parse the text and read it carefully and, and derive the meaning from the grammatical historical context and all that stuff. But that's not what happens. I don't delve into the, the text and the wording and the grammar and figure out what it means. The spirit has to be working. And that's where we, we talk that way too, is not only in the text, in, in our encounter with nature and our encounter with other people, that the spirit is the one who teaches me who Christ is. And so I do have to start with Jesus revealing himself through the spirit that he sends. And then having come to that understanding of Christ, now I can go back and particularly as he's talking here, read those Old Testament stories that, that you can't read unveiled unless you come to Christ first. That's, that's explicitly what he's saying, right? Like that same veil, that veil, boy, I mean, he's applying it to, I know, the Old Testament and to the, the Jews in particular reading it, right? Right. Here. But, boy, that seems to very well uh, describe also my own like reading of Christian texts in the New Testament growing up and to some extent I'm sure today. Yeah, no, I no, and you're right, because again, I was kind of no freedom. Right. Yeah. It didn't bring liberty, right? <laughs> but the reason the reason was we kind of read it we read it chronologically. We started with the Old Testament. We saw how God, at least in my tradition, God had established a covenant and a law. And all what we kind of said was with Jesus, the law had been changed, but it was still a law. It was now the law of Christ. And we ended up being just as legalistic as the Pharisees would have been, but now we were legalistic about church and not Sabbath and not eating kosher. We were legalistic about what you did on a Sunday morning, right? But why did we read our New Testament text that way? Because we started with our Old Testament text to build a framework and then interpreted those Christian texts in keeping with what was a legalistic framework of the Mosaic law. 
But what Jesus says is you can't do it that way. You have to start with me and go backwards. And that's what Paul's saying is you'll, ha you'll have a veil over your understanding if you try and read it as it is chronologically. Well, the first thing, you know, is about Genesis and in the beginning, so I'll start there. But by the time you get through 39 books of the Old Testament and you start with the Gospels, you've got all these ideas that you're now trying to squeeze Jesus to make fit with those texts, right? And if we start with Jesus, as revealed by the Spirit, liberty, grace, mercy, the love of God, then you go back and you look at those other stories and you say, now I derive spiritual meanings, metaphorical meanings, morals perhaps, but not necessarily just literal readings. That's so notice verse 18. Or verse 18 is, is a lovely mystical verse, right? This is mystical. But we all, with unveiled face, the veil was the inability to read those old covenant texts. See, now, now Paul's speaking as a Pharisee, having been under that veil and, and jailing and being there at Stephen's death, thinking he's doing the Lord's work. He's, he was veiled honestly thought he was reading the will of God correctly. But now he's saying, I had something obscuring my vision. But we all with unveiled face, with that having been re removed by Christ, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of what we see. We're looking at the Lord and we're being transformed into the image of Christ because he we're beholding him, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So there's this picture of we, be, we behold the glory of God and we're changed by it. The light of God penetrates us, changes us. And this is the work of the Spirit. But the image is, the Spirit is not the image. The image is Christ. Christ is the image of the invisible God. So he's talking about we're looking at Christ as illuminated by the Spirit to see the glory of Christ, which is the glory of God in the face of Christ, and we're being utterly transformed. Bob. Is it like at the crucifixion when the uh, veil, if you will, at the Holy of Holies... <laughs> torn asunder, and then the sacred merges with the profane, and they are all unified as one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because Matthew, Matthew relates that as a Jewish writer of a gospel, because to his Jewish audience, the symbolism of a torn veil that separates in the, you know, even parts of the temple from other parts of the temple the, the symbolic meaning of that is overwhelming to a Jewish audience, right? What, what was forbidden, where only the high priest could go once a year with a rope tied to his leg in case he did something wrong and died in there, they could drag the body out because they can't go in there to get him. They can't leave a dead body in there for, you know, I mean, literally that's what they did. They tied a rope to the leg of the high priest. If he screwed up and God struck him dead, they'd pull the body out and next year the next high priest could try, right? You know? Where's the liberty, right? You know, but that forms an idea of God, right? You're so scared to enter the presence of God to go right into the presence of God because you might get killed, right? So, yeah, so the, the, the metaphor of the tearing of the, the veil at the death of Christ, yeah, you could link it up with what Paul's saying. A veil is removed, right? And now we can see. But what we can see is how to read our scriptures differently. And can you see how Paul's doing that? He takes an incident about a shiny face on Moses, and so he starts putting on a veil, and he takes it off when he goes to see the Lord, and he puts it back on when he's with Israel. Sounds like an anecdote. And Paul sees in it, oh no, it's a metaphor of, of how the Spirit works to reveal to us the true intent of God. And the veil represents our ignorance, right? And the removal of the veil is the work of God. He takes, 
this incident from Exodus 34 and he turns it into a metaphor for a spiritual reality. He's making an allegory out of it. So he's doing what we're saying. He's, he's reading that Exodus 34 text spiritually, not simply literally. He sees in it something very spiritual going on or being talked about. So he would, see, he would ironically say, I can read Exodus 34 this way because the veil's gone. Right? The very fact of what I'm asserting gives me the ability to read this text in a way that any Jew would have read it and not seen that implication. But I see it because now in Christ, the veil's gone and it's about Christ. And so this Moses wearing a veil is somehow talking about Jesus and is talking about a veil that Jesus will take off and the glory of Jesus, not the glory that was on Moses' face, but now the glory of God shining on us. Do you see how he's... He's taking this story and he's turning it into something all about Christ and our relationship with Christ. Okay. Thoughts, questions? I, I got a question. So yeah. Bob made me like to come because he was telling me uh, about <laughs> the, the book that he's reading right now by Marilyn Robinson, Unpacking Genesis, and just how well she does in terms of taking all those, uh, you know, stories in Genesis and you know, the root of, you know, here's how our our story of our God is different than the Babylonian God. Here's how our story, our flood story is different than the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here's how our, so is that, is seeing those stories as redemptive contrast to the other pagan religions where they were offering child sacrifices, yet Abraham doesn't offer Isaac as a child sacrifice, is that how we see Christ in so many of those stories? And can you get, is, is it ever irresponsible to try to read Christ into some text in the Old Testament? No, it's never irresponsible to read Christ in, into those texts. You may have to read him quite creatively into those texts, but that's what, that's what Christ is saying. They're all speaking about me. So he's, he's saying you do that. What, <clears throat> what it sounds like, part of what she's doing, which is very good work, it's at, even some of that has to do with the natural reading. Right. She's getting at what the actual author was doing, which was drawing contrast and, and changing other contemporary accounts of creation and things like that. Which was at the symbolic level. It's like, well, you know, right. our Abraham figure is right. different than... So, so her book is, is helping us even read the natural reading better. Like, what was Moses really doing? Well, he knew the Babylonian stories. He knew the Egyptian stories. He was telling other versions which, which had different visions of God. Even Moses was trying to do that in the natural reading. But to take a metaphorical reading can be on a whole other plane entirely. Than what it sounds, than her work, right. but her work's very good. That could even, it was reading things like what you're talking about that started opening me up to realize that these texts didn't just mean what I thought they meant. That that they were taking up a story that already pre-existed in other cultures, and they were modif and that it was being modified. Even that helped me to start thinking, oh, so it's just not telling me an account. It's contrasting with other alleged accounts of who the gods are and what they do. So it started me, started me down the path of, of, of realizing, yeah, something else is going on here than I thought. But the metaphorical can even be more, uh, you know, untethered from the literal. Yeah, Bill? Like an allegory? Or, yeah, I mean, because I know some of them, uh, now I have to read it not as a literal, but as a metaphorical. Or, you know, uh, but it's like, how do you know? I mean, you know, uh, because I used to get all twisted up, um, even, you know, growing up in church, 
really when I was older than the Navy I started reading the Bible or trying to you know understand it and, but I went off on a tangent kind of crazy thinking I could see the future and make these things started happening were so weird that you know but a lot of it I just wasn't understanding right plus I was bipolar so that God was speaking directly to me yeah yeah no, it, it, like you, all of us, I think, have found difficulty in reading the scriptures. Um, to at one, you know, to one degree or another, we've all had difficulty doing that. They don't just like, you know, the kind of thing that I heard growing up. It means what it says. Says what it means. Like this is simple, folks. It is not simple, right? Again, if it were simple, Paul wouldn't have missed it so badly. A guy who was well versed in all of it and could be so totally off the heart of God. He did not find the heart of God by reading his Old Testament text. He missed it entirely. So he was a violent man, which he confesses to. And I was a violent man. Well, of course, he read his Old Testament text and he thought his God was a violent God until Jesus confronted him and said, I'm not violent. And then he had to rethink everything. And that's what he's saying in, in 2 Corinthians 3 is a veil came off and it can come off for you too, but you got to come to the Lord first and then look back. So you're reading in reverse. Okay, let's look at another example where he does it. Now, what we're, what we're saying is you can do this with every text. It may have a very wholesome spiritual meaning in its most natural reading. But that doesn't mean you can't also see a metaphorical reading on a layer on top. It's more, sometimes the natural reading of a particular thing is not compatible with the nature of God as revealed in Christ. When you run into that kind of situation, you, you have to abandon the natural reading and you just have to say, we're going to look for spiritual readings. Yeah. But sometimes you have a natural reading, which is very... So, so I did that this morning when I said that the fact Jesus was born in an unused... or was raised from an unused tomb is a kind of virgin tomb. I'm seeing something metaphorical, even though the natural reading is not like the natural reading is corrupt or something or difficult. The fact that he was laid in an unused tomb is a very fine natural reading. But to see a metaphor there is to see a layer in addition to the literal. Does that make sense? It's just, you can do that. Well, let's see where Paul does it. I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 4. And this, again, is going to be Paul using an Old Testament account and developing a lengthy allegory. So Galatians chapter 4, and maybe by practicing this and seeing this done, we can help all of us learn how to do it. So exactly what Bill's articulating is it takes practice. We have to see, oh, how do I do it? How do I read it this way? But here's an example of Paul again. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the, the bond woman and one by the free woman. The free woman is Sarah. Her handmaid, Hagar, he's calling a slave woman. Now, he's doing this because of the metaphor he wants to use, right? <laughs> so he says, Abraham has two children, one by his, his wife, Sarah, who's a free woman, and another by a slave woman, Hagar. Verse 23, but the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. Now here he says it literally. This is allegorically speaking. <laughs> I'm making a metaphor. He tells you I'm making an allegory, right? Which, we're, which part of what we're saying is that's what Christian tradi tradition tells us. We can make allegories just like Paul's doing. He says, this is allegorically speaking. He's not saying that this is the natural, literal meaning of reading those accounts of how Abraham and Sarah decide to try and have a, a, a child and fulfill the promise through Hagar. You know, he, 
he's not following the narrative. He's using it to make another point. Verse 24, this is allegorically speaking, for these two women are two covenants. That's an allegory right now because there's nothing in the, in the original story that says they're two covenants. Right? They're two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not fear. Break forth and shout, you who are, in, who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband." And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. So he's developing this allegory saying Christians are like Isaac, the children of a free woman. And Jews who who do not understand that freedom are slaves born of Sinai, born of the law, and they persecute us. Well, he's writing to Christians who were actually being persecuted by Jews who were demanding that these Christians who were Gentiles be circumcised or they couldn't be Christian. And so he's saying, he makes an allegory of Hagar and Sarah and illustrates a, what he says is a spiritual truth. And we're the spiritual children of Sarah from the new Jerusalem and not of the present day earthly Jerusalem, which is like Sinai, which is law, which is slavery. Now, you might say, I don't find that a very convincing allegory. It was to those people, right? We don't tend to think allegorically as much. But he develops this metaphor because it would have been an aha moment for his readers because they put great value in such metaphors if you could ferret out a kind of hidden spiritual meaning that was underneath the obvious, people went, wow, I see your point. That makes sense? Ancient peoples love this kind of stuff. Modern people, we have trouble because we only know how to operate at the level of the natural, the literal. And we, we, don't, we don't tend to be as enthralled with a metaphor that's not, you know, how are you saying these two women represent two covenants and how do you know that Hagar is Sinai and present day Jerusalem and how do you know that Sarah is, is a Jerusalem from, you know, see, we would get into how do you know that to be the case? That's not what the text is saying and we would like get caught up. You can go way too far. And what? You can go way too far with it too. Well, you can, but, but not if you, I mean, yeah, because truthfully, I was here's what I was told in, in undergraduate Bible studies. It says, you're going to see the, the, bio, the gospel writers doing things with the Old Testament text, but you are not to do that. That's exactly what we were told. Like, you're going to see him make an allegory, you don't do that. I mean, we were warned off of doing it because the fear would be you'll go too far. Because... The emphasis was on you must ferret out the literal meaning of what the author intended in his time and space. And, you know, that's the whole meaning of the text right there. And to make allegories is to go astray. Even though the people in the text were making allegories, we were told not to. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that it is as dangerous as I was led to believe. Like, you... Because the thing is, if I try and make an allegory that is not of Christ and all of you know Christ, you'll completely reject my allegory, right? My metaphor, you'll say, well, that's not true of Jesus. And, I, and because that's where they were coming from, they were coming from a place of, it is through the Spirit that we know the Christ. And so we can allegorize these Old Testament stories to illustrate what it is that we believe about the Christ. And they all saw, yeah, that's true, because they were all coming from, but we already know Christ. And so the allegory holds water for us, right? 
And here's the interesting thing. You could allegorize Sarah and Hagar in other ways. You don't have to. It's not like the only allegory of those two women and their sons is the one Paul works up. You could work up another one, which would be just as valid. The way Hagar, the way God came to her when she was just so desperate in the desert, and, and the love of God, you know, loved in her just as much as Sarah. And that's, yes. That's an amazing story right. to me. And, and, and But the story of going too far, sometimes people act like they're condemned because they did this out of, out of not waiting on God, and that's, that's just a bigger story. Yes, yeah. yeah, see, and to your point is, Paul doesn't even mention the fact, because someone could object to Paul's allegory, saying, wait a minute, but God took care of Hagar, and, and you're making her out to be the bad one. He's making an allegory, folks. He's not trying to take in the whole, the, the what happened, because you could make Hagar into an allegory much more like a mistreated woman, and she was mistreated. She, she was, you could talk about her as someone who had very little freedom because she was a slave woman and she had to bear the son of Abraham because she was forced to. And then Sarah turns around and gets jealous of her and kicks her out, which is more abuse, right? So you could take the story of Hagar and allegorize it as how God cares for those who are mistreated in the world. And that would be a true story. Right? And Christ coming to Hagar to rescue this woman and her son. And that would be a true reading. Does that make sense? But it's a completely different allegory. It's taking her story and making it a metaphor for the mercy and grace of, of God for those who get mistreated, you could even say, mistreated religiously. <laughs> you know, it could be an allegory of how some people have church trauma and got beat up in church and kicked out like Hagar got kicked out, and yet God cares for them. And that's a whole different reading, and I would say, but that's true to Christ, just like Paul's reading is true to Christ. But he's not saying Hagar is literally this. He's saying, in my allegory, she represents this. He is not besmirching her character at all. Right. So let me ask this: Is is when you're reading something allegorically, does it is it a healthier reading to read the allegory in the tradition of people who have read scripture allegorically? Because I mean, somebody might say, "I think this person represents Betty White, and this person represents Vladimir Putin," and that's my <laughs> allegorical reading. Uh, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, you could. So, like, when you're doing yeah. it, do you? look at the church fathers and look at how they well, read allegorically. Right. That's what, that's what I want us to do. Okay. We're, we're going to do some more of that. We're, I mean, you've got Paul doing it. Paul does it a number of times, but other, other New Testament writers do it. We start with them, and then we can, we can kind of learn how this goes, right? But it always has to be Christ-centered. It has to be illuminating your relationship with Christ. The allegory is all about Christ. Now, Jim, you had a daughter... Right. And you know, so there's, I, I like to see what others are saying now, but part of me wants to just do it some on my own. And then I might be wrong. I, mean, I might say, okay, hey, how do we back off of that one? But yeah. if I'm only reading other people's creativity, then I don't want to engage mine. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying. Yeah, because that's what we always heard was fear of the slippery slope but no one ever articulated a fear of not trying this or, or, or like the dangers of not trying this. And I love the way you flip that. Is there a danger in not reading things metaphorically? I mean, we always, oh, it's a danger of reading it metaphorically. Yeah, but what happens to our faith if we never read anything metaphorically? Then we got to read like that, you know, what's the psalm that ends with dashing the baby's heads against the rocks? Um, you familiar? This is one of the toughies. If you want to talk about a scripture that's hard to read, 
Is it 37? Stan's favorite person. Okay. Well, <laughs> well then maybe. That's what happened in my head. <laughs> I thought it was. No. I thought it was like 137. 137. Is it 137? Last verse. See, see now, this, this is one of those verses that you're saying, is this our God? Is this Jesus? How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. This is, this is a, a psalm written against Babylon by people who are slaves in Babylon and saying, we're looking forward to the day when somebody grabs your infant children and beats their brains out against the rock. They will be blessed by God. Right? That's what it's saying. Blessed is the one who kills infants. The example for us, though, is Christ on the cross. Right. This is, this is in contradiction. to death instead of exacting out right. punishment. So, so that's, that's the reason. 10,000 angels. Right. That's the reason when you read Psalm 137, verse 9, you can't say, I guess that's true. Because it's the opposite of what Jesus does. So what do you do? Well, you say the literal meaning. Literally, what is it? It's some really angry Israelites who are in exile, who are really, really angry at their enemies and are praying for the day their enemies get what's coming to them. I totally sympathize with their position, right? I understand their emotion, but I can't read it as this is inspired instruction, like Really, that's the way to do the work of God. So I, I'll tell you what the, what the Desert Fathers did. They said, what this means is this is how you have to deal with your sins. And you have to kill them when they're still infants. Because if you let your sins grow up to maturity, then you will be overwhelmed. So grab the babies, your sins, when they're small, and put them to death. They read it totally spiritually and ignored the obvious heinous, immediate, natural reading, which, which is, you know, which we, no one should ever do in the name of God, right? But that's what they did. And they did that because they knew it can't mean literally now as Christians what it meant literally by the people who wrote it. So we read it spiritually and say, yeah. And that's not the only metaphor, but that's one they made out of it. And, it. and it rings true, right? It's absolutely true. If you don't stop a sin when it's small, when it gets bigger, it'll own you, right? Okay, they found a truth in that, and that's how they read it. Does that make sense? Is that helping? But I love your idea. Yeah. What's the danger of us not ever doing this, not engaging our creativity, not reading metaphor and allegory? finding ethical morals, you know, ethical things like moral things, things that we ought to do out of texts, but on a spiritual level, not necessarily on a literal level. The safeguard to all of that is, but it has to be consistent with the person of Christ. And I think it has to be done in community, right? The safeguard is if I share my metaphor and you, you say, mm-mm, that doesn't, you know, then I, I, I take that to heart. It's like, but you're, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Maybe, I mean, we read texts together, right? We, we need to do the spiritual work together, not individually, um, autonomously. Or I could end up down some rabbit trail of my own creation. But you won't let me do that, right? Because if we share it together, someone says, yeah, but maybe we need to tweak that. That, that doesn't sound like that's really a good reading. Is that a different animal that you're using those, not, not just with reading the true text, but when you see a, a movie and you watch it with your kids and say, let's read into this, yeah. what the story's telling us. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we, we see underlying stories, things that are being told, things that are being said, yeah, in music, in art, in movies, novels, yeah, it's the same sort of process. Okay.
Well, we'll stop there for, for today, um, but next week we'll take up some more, some practical examples, and hopefully that will continue to help.